Hey, what's up everybody? Mr. White here. We are going to continue into circuits by talking voltage today. Now, before we get into what voltage is, a little bit of a disclaimer. I want you to understand that this is a little bit of a trickier topic to understand and visualize. And I'm telling you this not to discourage you, but to remind you to be patient with yourself, okay? It may take maybe another view of the video or asking some additional questions to understand these concepts, but that's okay. Just be patient and understand that it, some parts of this may not be as straightforward as you would prefer. Now, a little bit of a recap on current. Uh, we know that current is how much charge passes a point each second. Uh, that gets measured in coulombs per second, and the unit of measure that we call one coulomb per second is one ampere, or one amp. Uh, high current means that more charge per second uh, flows by, and low current means that less charge each second flows by. But what exactly causes electrons to flow? Why do they flow? And what's the whole point of this electricity business anyway? Well, both of those questions could be answered with the same answer, and that is energy. Our devices that we use run on energy, and electrons are the things that deliver that energy to our devices. Things like our phones, our microwaves, our TVs, our computers, our, our iPads, whatever you're watching this video on is running off of electrical energy, and that has to get delivered to your device. Electrons deliver that energy. So how do electrons get this energy? I'm going to throw this question to the checkered shirt, Mr. White, and see what he says. So let's start with an example we're a little bit more familiar with. Before we get into that though, remember this, energy flows from high to low. Now, unless you've been to space, I haven't, all we've ever experienced is Earth's gravity pulling us towards the floor. There's actually an attraction between us and Earth. Any mass is gonna be attracted to other mass. That's a whole different topic of conversation. We know that if we drop something, it falls. Earth's gravity is pulling things down towards the ground. Because everything in Earth's vicinity feels this force pulling on it, we say that Earth has a gravitational field. A gravitational field is defined as the region around a mass where another mass would feel a force. Now, since things usually wanna go that way in Earth's field, if I want this to go that way, I'm going to need to use some energy. I'm gonna take energy from me and I'm going to use that energy to lift the box up here. I have now given this box gravitational potential energy. The box has a lot of gravitational potential energy here. It has no gravitational potential energy here. Now you remember earlier when I said energy wants to flow from high to low, high energy, low energy. If the box is here at high energy, it's gonna to wanna to flow to low energy. Magnets have fields too. Here I have two magnets with the same poles pointed towards each other. When I try to push them together, they repel. To bring them together, I have to push against their magnetic fields. If I do bring them together, I have now stored magnetic potential energy in them, which can be seen when I let go of one of the magnets. That magnetic potential energy becomes kinetic energy in the magnet that moves away. Now just like magnets, charges have fields too, electric fields. So what if I had an electron and I placed another electron within its electric field? What would it want to do? And because those are like charges, they would want to move away from each other. They would repel. How could I move the electron to the other one? And just like the magnets, I would have to apply a net force towards the electron to get them together. Now, what would happen if I stopped applying that force? And again, just like with the magnets, we would see the electrons repel. Now, hopefully all these examples seem related or familiar uh, because we can think about them in the same way. In all of these cases, we're working against a field. And when we work against a field, we end up storing potential energy. And so in the case of the box, when we lift the box against Earth's gravitational field, we are giving it gravitational potential energy. And with an electric charge, an electron, when we work against the electric field, we are storing electric potential energy in that electron. So moving electrons closer to ele other electrons and basically combining their fields, they're all gonna try to repel, and that's essentially like lifting the box. You're giving them electric potential energy by working against their field, just like we gave the box gravitational potential energy by working against the gravitational field. Now, do you remember when I said earlier that energy likes to flow from high to low? Well, here, red shirt Mr. White is rolling balls down a ramp, and they are moving from high potential energy to low potential energy, just as we would expect. 
Now here, red shirt Mr. White is attempting to roll balls on a flat ramp. Why isn't this working? Maybe not enough potential energy? All right, well, let's put the ramp up on chairs. More potential energy, right? They're up higher. But still no rolling. So what really matters here? Well, once Mr. White creates a difference in potential energy from one end of the ramp to the other, the balls roll. Success! No matter where we put the ramps, all that matters is the difference between the start of the path and the end of the path. That's it. To make the ball move, it needed to have more potential energy at the start of the path than at the end of the path. If there's no difference in potential energy from one end to the other, it just won't work, no matter how you stack it. So this is it. That's voltage. Voltage is the difference in electric potential energy per unit of charge between two points in a path. And by path, we're usually talking about a circuit. So just like the balls on the ramp had more potential energy at the top of the ramp than the bottom, which caused them to roll, when you put electrons together, when they want to repel against their field, you're giving them potential energy. And that potential energy is greater at the start of a circuit than at the end, and that causes them to want to move through the circuit. That potential energy difference is voltage. So we say that voltage is the amount of electric potential energy per unit of charge, or the number of coulombs that you have. Uh, it's represented by a, an uppercase V when you abbreviate the unit. And uh, again, it's joules of energy divided by coulombs of charge. This is what causes current to flow. This is the big idea. But why did I emphasize per unit of charge? Bear with me on this one. So for voltage, why do we have to use electric potential energy per unit of charge? Why couldn't I just say voltage is equal to the difference in potential energy from here to here? Well, a voltage source like a battery or generator applies a voltage across a circuit, just like say these books apply a voltage of source sorts by raising the ramp on this side, giving us a difference in potential energy from here to here. The ball at the top of the ramp will have more energy than it would at the bottom of the ramp. There's a difference in energy and the ball wants to flow from high energy to low energy. Now that difference in potential energy is shown by the steepness of the ramp. If I have a really steep ramp, I have a lot of potential energy difference. The ball has a lot of potential energy up here. It has no potential energy here. I'm gonna get a lot of rolling. If there's no slope, there's no difference in the amount of potential energy the ball would have here, or here, and so there's no reason for the ball to want to roll from point A to point B. Remember, energy flows from high to low. Now, does that mean that adding more balls adds more difference in potential energy to our system? Oh man, I gotta clean that up. The answer is no. Sure, by adding more balls here, I've added more potential energy to the system, but the amount of energy per ball stays the same. The amount of energy given to each ball stays the same. The amount of energy that each ball will change its energy by stays the same. Now in a circuit, each coulomb of charge will experience the same change in potential energy as every other coulomb. We could add more coulombs, but they're still gonna experience that same change in potential energy from one end of the circuit to the other. And that change, that difference is called voltage. To say that adding more electrons will mean more voltage is like saying adding more balls would create a bigger difference from the top to the bottom of the ramp. Basically saying adding more balls will raise the ramp. And that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So don't forget, electric potential energy difference per unit of charge, that is voltage. Here's another visual that kind of explains the same thing. And so if you wanna take a look at this, go ahead and pause. All right, so I know that was a little tricky, um, but it is important enough to actually have its own name. Unfortunately, whoever named it, named it really similar to something else. And so we call the amount of electric potential energy per unit of charge, the electric potential energy per coulomb, electric potential. Yeah, electric potential energy per unit of charge is called electric potential. I'm sorry, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. All right, so since electric potential is equal to electric potential energy per unit of charge, and voltage is the difference in electric potential energy per unit of charge between two points, we can say that voltage is the difference in electric potential between two points. I know, I know, tricky. 
Now, when we talk voltage sources, we can talk about things like batteries, which convert chemical energy, chemical potential energy to electrical energy. Uh, we can talk generators, which convert mechanical energy to electrical energy. Um, but basically anything that, when attached to a closed circuit, creates a difference in potential energy per unit of charge between the ends of the circuit, we consider that a voltage source. In electric circuits, to keep the current flowing, voltage needs to be maintained. No voltage is like a flat ramp, and as we saw, nothing's going to roll down a flat ramp. Charge is not going to move if there's no potential difference across the circuit. The circuit must be connected to both terminals of the voltage source. One end of the circuit needs to be connected to the positive terminal. The other end of the circuit needs to be connected to the negative terminal. Otherwise, there's no way for that voltage source to create that difference in potential. Finally, the circuit must be closed. Any gaps in the circuit will break the connection from positive terminal to negative terminal. Now, when you flip off the light switch in your room and you turn the lights off, you've opened the circuit which basically eliminates that potential difference in the circuit. So electrons are not going to flow, your light turns off. So yeah, that can be handy, but if you want current flowing, the circuit needs to be closed and complete. And so like I mentioned, batteries, that's an example of a voltage source. Uh, batteries are very interesting and very complex, so I will try to summarize as quickly and as simply as possible. Um, but basically what's happening inside of batteries, you have uh, multiple chemical reactions. So at the negative end of a battery, if you ever look at a battery, you'll see a plus side and a negative side. At the negative end of the battery, there is a chemical reaction resulting in the release of electrons. And so electrons will build up at the negative end of a battery. On the positive end of a battery, simultaneously, there is another reaction that actually absorbs electrons. And so in the negative end of a battery, you have this push of electrons because they're all bunching together and they want to get away from each other. And on the other end of the battery, you have this pull for electrons. Now this push at the negative end to push the electrons away, they're trying to repel, provides a little bit of potential energy. And the pull at the other end, the positive end, trying to pull electrons in, also adds to the potential energy. So this combined effect of pushing and pulling is what gives us our voltage. That's how we get current to flow through a closed circuit. So why don't electrons just take a quick detour through the battery instead of going through the entire circuit? The answer is they can't. There's something inside a battery called an electrolyte. An electrolyte won't let lone electrons, electrons by themselves, uh, through this barrier they need to hitch a ride on other atoms, basically turning those atoms into ions. Ions are able to move through the electrolyte. Uh, and this electrolyte keeps a balance between the terminals so you don't get too much push from one end and too little pull from the other or vice versa. Like I said, it's a pretty complex process. If you do want to know more, please feel free to ask and I will tell you what I can and hopefully be able to answer all your questions. But to summarize batteries, does a larger battery mean larger voltage? And the answer is no. Larger battery actually means that it can supply more charge all at once, or it can supply less charge over a longer period of time. So all of the batteries that you see here, a D cell, a C cell, a AA or AAA, all of those batteries actually have the same voltage, 1.5 volts. Um, so they all apply the same voltage across the circuit. The difference between these batteries is how much current they can provide or how much charge they can provide all at once uh, or for how long they can provide a steady flow of charge over time. So what is it exactly that determines the voltage then in a battery? If it's not the size of a bigger battery doesn't give you voltage, what is it then? And there's a couple answers and it could either be the compounds inside the battery and or uh, the combination of smaller batteries within that larger battery. Yeah, we've been lied to. The inside of this 9-volt battery is actually made up of six 1.5-volt batteries. And when you multiply 1.5 times 6, you get 9. Lies! So again, all of the batteries at the top have the same voltage, 1.5 volts. Um, but depending on the size of the battery, um, there's more reactants in the battery to produce more electrons at one time. They can supply more of those electrons at any given time. So larger toys that might have more moving parts and need to supply more charge at the same voltage over time, 
uh, are going to use larger batteries. But charge in both batteries or any of those batteries that you see at the top of the screen will experience the same potential difference. 1.5 joules for every coulomb or 1.5 volts. Well, that wraps it up. Hopefully that helped. If uh, you're still having some trouble, consider re-watching parts of the video or definitely ask questions in class. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.